it. This is John Smith from University of Highlands and Islands. He's going to do a presentation, sorry, Highlands and the, no, Hi, University of the Highlands and Islands, to get the branding 100% right. Um, he's going to go through a presentation on how they use Helix Media Library within their organisation. And he tells me he's going to keep it really, really short and sweet, Very short. even though we've given him an entire hour no. to do it. <laughs> um, if, if John does run short, I mean, he, he's going to take some questions and all that sort of stuff. There's normally a lot of questions when people run through these things. If he does run short, we'll go into one of the uh, presentations on scaling the solution. We'll do a bit of that before lunch. Lunch will be at one, um, and then you'll have an hour for lunch, and then we'll, we'll run through the other presentations after lunch. And there's, there's various other bits and pieces that, that I've, I've got as a contingency for that anyway. But I'll, I'll leave you with John, okay. and he'll explain how they use Helix Media Library. Thanks, okay, John. thanks, Rob. Yeah, uh, Chris told me 20 minutes, and so 20 minutes I've done, you'll be pleased to know, rather than one hour. So I'll happily take questions about our implementation at the end of the, the presentation I'm going to give. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of coming down here uh, to talk to you today about the impl implementation of Helix Media Library at the University of the Highlands and Islands. I think to start with, I'll probably give you a little bit of context uh, so you can understand why video is important to us in our blended learning delivery. So that's the kind of uh, start to the presentation. I'll move into what we, what we have eventually done with Helix Media Library and a little bit about what we might be doing with it in the future. I'm the head of Integrated Technologies and Resources at the university, and it's part of the Department of Learning and Information Services. And hopefully if I do that, the presentation will change. I have just 10 staff looking after the majority of the web-based services that our students use at the university. As you'll see on the map here, the little stars point out where those 10 staff are located. On four islands in the Scottish Highlands, and in, sorry, Yes, on four islands and in three locations in the Scottish mainland. This section's part of a larger department uh, with about 40 staff in total. My section supports... Ooh, that's not what we wanted. My section supports a large-scale video conferencing service, educational technology services, software integration and application development, e-resource procurement and management, along with library management for not just ourselves, but two other higher education institutions in Scotland through a shared service initiative. So it's a pretty broad spectrum, a broad portfolio. I have a distributed staff. They're pretty much spread out, but that's okay because I work in a distributed university. It's also the newest university in Scotland. The University of the Highlands and Islands is in fact a partnership of 13 colleges and further education institutions spread across the highlands of Scotland, in that great big green bit there. We have some unique delivery problems because of that area. Both the physical and social geography require some unique delivery solutions to ensure that what we deliver to our staff and students meets their expectations and meets with the academic, financial and social requirements of the population that we serve. In addition to the 13 colleges that make up the university, our technical infrastructure also services 70 learning centres located. Those 70 learning centres deal with most of the Scottish islands and the larger population centres within the highlands of Scotland. Our campus there is roughly the same size as Belgium. It's pretty big. But the total population of the region is about one third that of Brussels. So I live and work one of the most sparsely populated areas of Europe. That requires many of our courses to be delivered across multiple sites to make up student numbers and to make up decent class sizes. So students come together to create their university experience and that university experience is supported through the use of educational technology. Probably a little bit more educational technology than some of the other institutions might need to put in place. I live and work in Lewis. That little red dot up there at the top corner. I live and work in the Isle of Lewis in the northwest coast of Scotland. And actually, I don't think I could be very much further away from my office than when I stand here in London. I don't believe I could get any further away. So there we go. <coughs> I'm based at Lewis Castle College in UHI in the town of Stornoway. 
And for the keen observers amongst you, if you watch the weather forecast, BBC weather forecast, you'll find Stornoway pretty prominently uh, mentioned and uh, pinpointed on the top of each and every map up there. I'll do a little bit for tourist information and tourist support trade for the island. This is my town. It's very beautiful. It's very remote. It's very rural, but it's nice. It's where I live. The college where I work here um, is one, as I say, of 13 partner colleges. I'll lose Castle College UHI. And the two guys on the side there come and visit our college every summer and have been doing for the last number of years. Um, so, as I say, it's maybe a different view to what many of you have out your office window. This is literally out my office window, uh, the Red Deer. So it's, it's, it's a kind of interesting little old uh, location to work in. The university is new. Um, we actually only gained title in 2011, um, although we have been offering degree programs and higher education programs through the Open University Validation Service since 2005. But many of our partners, many of the colleges that make up the university have been in operation maybe since the 1950s and 60s. So a new higher education institution, a new university, but with some established colleges uh, that were part of that delivery. The university is relatively small, I think, by any standards. We just have about, just about 8,000 students involved in higher education. Um, but the partners, the academic partners, also provide further education to a student population of just about 35,000. So the technical solutions that we have to put in place have to scale to a user base of around about 35,000 users. <coughs> It's truly distributed. The partner colleges, excuse me, the partner colleges with their local services are brought together with our regional network and telecommunications infrastructure, and Helix is part of that. The principal means for synchronous communication is video conferencing. So we're a large scale video conferencing institution. Uh, we use video conferencing for the delivery of tutorials, seminars and lectures and these are supported with other learning tools including virtual learning environments, social media applications, assessment services and of course rich media, rich media streaming. The network diagram here represents the virtual university, I think, uh, but it underpins a pretty significant real institution that operates across the region and for the community that it serves. So video and rich media are important to our organization and indeed we wouldn't be able to operate without them. We're the largest users of video conferencing, studio-based video conferencing in the United Kingdom and I think the latest stats will still show that the University of the Highlands and Islands on, it, on its own uses the same amount of video conferencing as all of the other higher education institutions in the UK put together. I'm not going to talk a huge amount about our video conferencing setup, but I do need to mention it because it forms a significant part of our rich media holding and is currently, the, as I said, the principal means of online synchronous delivery for the university. But it's part of a learning landscape. It's part of a learning landscape that includes everything from face-to-face -to, -face to fully online courses that are included in the delivery of our academic portfolio. To give you a very brief overview of the setup that we have for video conferencing. We use Cisco Tanberg uh, equipment in the main. Um, we have local bridging facilities within the university to be able to link up to 160 concurrent studio conferences at full high definition television quality. And in addition, we can also run 120 studio sessions at standard definition quality. We also have the ability to run video to the desktop in any one year, we would normally do about 15,000 multi-point video conferences. So it's a large scale operation. The output from our video conference bridge can be digitally recorded and we have the capacity to record up to 15 concurrent uh, multi-point sessions. We currently hold about 4,000, maybe 4,500 individual learning objects that are part of the recording of the academic portfolio. So in terms of rich media, that's where we stood three years ago. A high quality standalone recording service fully integrated with our corporate video conferencing system and a separate learning environment, which we had then just moved into Blackboard external hosting. Technically, I wanted 
a more streamlined solution. We had these disparate, separate systems. I wanted something to pull that together. And something that would minimize the need and requirement for staff and students to have to bounce between multiple and disparate systems. You can imagine, of course, that training a population that's distributed across this size of region is a real problem. So what we wanted to do was ensure that we had a minimum requirement of training with maximum exposure to the required technology. In addition to this business of video as a means, we also had other drivers uh, as a means of delivery. We, other, we had other drivers beginning to appear within the organization. We have similar challenges to other universities with business drivers, including increasing student numbers, as we all have, and financial constraints, again, as we all have, calling for more efficient and effective means of delivery. Our vice chancellor is keen to explore and develop opportunities in the United States and in China. And so the issue of time shifting, the simple business of time shifting with synchronous delivery using video conferencing wasn't something that was going to work as a solution for that. So I see a move to the development of rich media artifacts to support flipped classroom style teaching and the need to host and deliver existing content to underpin the teaching and learning activities of the university. These drivers require a different technology and a different technological approach and any new technology that we put in place must have minimal training and support requirements. <clears throat> we investigated a heap of systems. We really looked at a large, large number of systems. And I'd been looking at Helix Media Library for a number of years. In fact, I'd been stalking Chris, whatever he is there, at trade shows and through webinars for, I don't know, maybe three years prior to us moving into the product. And I was keeping an eye on the developments of Heli development of Helix, Me Helix Media Library within the higher education sector, looking for growth that I thought would support our risk assessment and looking for the product to meet some of the needs and requirements that we had. Any move to new technology requires some risk assessment and part of that would be who's using the product? Are they using it at scale? Will it integrate with our other existing technologies? Can it be introduced and will it grow with us? What are the cost implications of growth? Importantly, because remember, we have 35,000 students potentially wanting to use something. So licensing, capitation licensing is a problem. If somebody comes along and says, we need to license you for 35,000, if today only 7,000 are using the, the actual application. So can it grow with us? And is there an exit strategy? We always have to think about if the product disappears, if we need to change, if we change any of the underlying technologies. So these are the things we had to consider. For me, for me, the license model of the media library was a winner. It actually worked for us perfectly. The support costs were acceptable and importantly, local, personal, and just about immediate. I like to be able to pick up the phone. I know who I'm going to be speaking to, or I know the team that I'm going to be speaking to. And that was something that really came loud and clear from dealing with Streaming Limited. It was clear at an early stage that we had to cater for a wide range of media types. So we had existing media in different uh, recording formats. We had students wanting to record material from different uh, devices. We had staff with legacy material. So the media library satisfied that measure. It had a basic at that stage integration with Blackboard, which was an important part of limiting the exposure of students to disparate and multiple systems. It was mobile friendly, uh, which from our statistics, the web statistics that we were generated showed us was increasingly important and indeed was becoming an expectation on the part of students. It integrated, of course, with our Active Directory system for access and that was pretty much a seamless process of being able to get that working within the organization. The other important consideration was that it had the potential to integrate with a range of technologies that I was sure we were going to use as part of this move to new horizons within the organization. <clears throat> so this is what we built. Um, a complex schematic, I think but actually a simplification of the technologies required for students accessing video in our organization. I think most of you will understand that we can upload video and audio. Everyone's doing that. This is there. Are an integration point between the Cisco Tanberg service and uh, the Helix Media Library, which was an important consideration for us. 
Um, Off-air recording and the reuse of broadcast materials has been useful and, impor and an important addition to the service portfolio within the organisation. The ease of uploading locally generated material in a number of formats was useful and the transcoding of those various formats into something that was ubiquitously available to mobile and desktop devices was a significant step forward for us, something we hadn't been able to do with previous technologies. We also introduced TechSmith Relay and Fuse, uh, which added functionality for lecturers, including lecture capture and uh, mobile capture. And these were important in supporting flipped classroom delivery. Later in this academic year, these purple boxes will come into play. We'll, we'll actually link and integrate the Cisco Tanberg service with the Helix Media Library. This was a, prod a project called Viper, um, and it was an integration as part of an Erasmus. I had some Erasmus students come to work with us. And so the Erasmus students built the front end, the web-based front end for them, and I commissioned Helix, sorry, I commissioned um, Streaming Limited to undertake some consultancy to alter the XML schema to allow us to pass ownership for the video material that we held in the, in the content system across into Helix Media Library. <clears throat> we also, at this stage, changed a little bit of the embedding capabilities of Mahara. We use Mahara for ePortfolio, so we changed the video embed capability there to allow it to pull material from Helix Media Library in addition to the Blackboard integration which we already had. So video, Camtasia Relay and Viper for Tanberg services, off-air recording via the one LAN Omnicom and that was us now beginning to really sweat Media Library pretty much to its ultimate capability. The integration with Mahara and Blackboard and the portal itself meant that for most students, their exposure to rich media in the organization was now beginning to be limited between either the portal or Blackboard. And now, actually, it's mostly, if they're accessing video, it's going to be via Blackboard. I don't think there's much else I need to say about that, other than the fact that prior to this, we had about five different places that students had to go to get rich media, and the experience and exposure was very different, depending on what we had by way of proxy settings and filtered security for the various sites that they might go to external to the university. So this was an important way of ensuring that all learning content that was meant for students was held within the organization, backed up within the organization, and exposed to the the groups that we wanted it exposed to. We currently only have about one and a half thousand items sitting in our media library. It's a small scale implementation at the moment. We're going to be linking it, as I say, to push everything uh, very shortly. And, as I, and at that point, Helix Media Library will be the sole point of contact for students. What we've been working in has basically been a long soak test with some load testing on the way prior to making this our single point of contact. We couldn't or didn't want to give up uh, all of our capability in the other services until we understood that this product was going to be fit for purpose and worked at scale, and it does do both. We're very happy with it as an organization. <clears throat> our user statistics, as I say, are modest at the moment, but with the next uh, integration point, we'll shift to having something in the region of 5,000 objects within the within the repository and something in the region of probably just under 1,000 off-air recordings at that stage. As a result of this shift, as a result of the move to making Helix Media Library core to our teaching and learning delivery, I've had to think about risk assessment and risk management of what we're going to do there. So we had one instance of the product running and this year, Hopefully, where's Dave? Somewhere next week. Uh, I guess he's going to set up a development instance for us again within the organization. So we want a development instance in, ad in addition to our production instance so we can test new functionality, um, look at integration points, uh, and check out uh, what we're going to do with any of the new services that are coming along. So I think that's one of the important growth points for any organization as you shift from having something which is nice to have and not central as it becomes closer to the center of a core delivery, you really need to start thinking about having those additional services uh, to allow you to check developments and check upgrades prior to implementing them. Up to this point, we've relied on, uh, I rely on Chris telling me, it's good, it will work. And so that's, 
And up to now, that's been, that, that's been fair. He's never lied to us yet. Um, uh, so that's fine. So we have the media library, and we've had it for, I think, about three years. Um, that first year, it was very much an engineering testbed. Then we started introducing it to a small number of academic uh, staff across um, different subject networks within the organization. And we got their feedback. Uh, we generated a little bit of uh, training material to support staff. And then eventually, we looked at the business of pushing it out across the whole of the institution. I think it's important to say here that the staff development requirements for us were tiny. Uh, we really didn't have to produce that much to support staff. And actually, we've done nothing to support students. Students just get on with it. They seem to be very happy and they don't get bogged down in anything. The screen workflows, the business workflows for, for uh, Helix for them uploading and for uh, watching material seems very straightforward. <coughs> so one of the things I wanted to talk about, I guess, just now is um, we've mentioned the development instance. I am keen to integrate it with our library management system. At the moment, if students go into the library management system and search for resources to do with their course, they're going to find journals, books, e-books, e-journals, and that's fine. But we're missing the mark on a large lump of material there that has been internally generated by the organization or has been recorded off air and deemed to be suitable in support of courses. So one of the things I want to do is look at how we can export from the Helix Media Library into something that will be able to generate a mark record for the library catalog. I think that's probably going to look at sucking the metadata that exists out of Helix Media Library into some middleware where a librarian or subject network librarian or subject network expert would add additional meta information to make it legitimately uh, a reasonable library catalog entry and then push it across. But I do think that's an important element within the organization that where resources are being generated, where learning objects are being generated uh, in one part of the organization, they need to be exposed into the tools that students and staff use for searching for them. And at the minute, you'd have to go into the media library to find what's there rather than just being able to search for it across the piece. <clears throat> I think the introduction of flipped classroom technologies, or flipped classroom teaching, I should say, is going to increase the amount of hosting that we're going to need and the amount of hosting that we're going to use. I fully expect a lot of the material that we're going to be using to come through open course initiatives, through open courseware, where we want to take material that's licensed and available, repurpose, reuse, and include it as part of our teaching material. And I'm also really keen for the staff to use, abuse, and include as much off air broadcast material as they can. These are high quality elements that historically, just even in the last 10 years, Staff used to make recordings and present them in lecture halls like this. Our, our situation is slightly different in that the students are spread into multiple sites, so the staff got out of the habit of using uh, off-air recorded material. We still paid an ERA license. We paid ERA plus licenses for all of the campus uh, institutions, but nobody was making recordings. So the introduction of the, the OneLAN actually started that process again, and it really has improved the production value that the students are exposed to. And things like the chapter marks that you have in Helix Media Library allow, allow those products to be soft edited. So although it might be the whole of a, a panorama or horizon program, you can actually specify the one small section of that program you want to use in your teaching and learning by setting chapter marks. Or you can, in fact, non-linearly use that material by setting chapter marks that take you perhaps to an end section in the middle, in the, the, the beginning of a program uh, to make it more useful in teaching and learning. So those were important for us, as I say. In conclusion, I think the, the implementation of the media library at UHI, it's opened up lots and lots of opportunities for us. It has and will streamline access to rich media, and that was really important. And it has encouraged our staff to include rich media in their teaching content. 
up until that point, up until the point of introduction, it was a problem. Other than what they did in synchronous delivery, straight synchronous, synchronous delivery, um, there was very little video. It was, a, it was a problem for them. Although they had devices that would record, they could record screencasts, they had no real way of including that in their teaching material. So it's been a big, big, important way of encouraging staff and students to embrace video and audio as an integral part of their teaching and learning. And I think that's all I have to say to you. See, I told you it was going to be short. So um, it's a very ordinary story. Uh, we're not an ordinary university. Um, and we have, as I say, some unique delivery problems because it's small populations spread over a large area. So this product for us has been really very important, a very, very important part of the portfolio of technologies we put in place. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. There are none good. Go I'm, I mean, it's not from a Helix point of view, actually. It's just... Do you like the deer? Yeah, <laughs> the names of the deer. No, from, just from the point of view of the, the student population, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about what you said. So it's a lot of students. Yes. What... So getting... I mean, the Highlands, it's a beautiful place, right? I don't dispute that, but attracting students yes. to go to go there that's a lot of students so are they people that lived in the highlands and islands or are they people from the outside coming okay. in if you can imagine uh, transportation is pretty difficult between yeah. these places normally historically students in the islands would head off to university down to uh, edinburgh glasgow aberdeen dundee yeah. they'd spend three years there and usually see the bright lights and then never go back so we had a brain drain thing going on out of the highlands into central scotland there had been moves uh, for, you know, moves to, to create a university in the Highlands for many, many, many years. The project to create the university kicked off in about 1995, I think. Um, and at that point, it was bringing together the further education colleges that existed within mm -hmm. the Highlands of Scotland and having an umbrella organisation called the University of the Highlands and Islands that would start to build um, university sorry, degree qualification courses for the students. That kicked off an odd student population, I guess. We are, are about 52% of our students are non-standard. They're, they're over the age of 24. So they've gone through some schooling. They might have gone to college, and then they've got into, gone into work. And once the university became established within the region, they've come back in as early mature students, I guess. Only this year we're beginning to see a slight increase in the traditional student population, so the, the 18, 18 to 20 year olds coming into the organisation. There's still quite a number of them leave and go down to, to other universities. As we increase the academic portfolio that's available to them through, and through market research trying to target uh, courses that people want to do, um, we're, that's where we see our growth. But uh, yeah, the, the, a lot of these students are, are uh, folk that are they may be in work uh, and so they've hit glass ceilings or they were looking for a job change and they want they want a different qualification to shift into some different space. I saw some of the video conferencing uh, content and it, it was younger people yeah. uh, that were there having a lecture from you know just a Know, a lecturer, a guy yeah. in his forties or whatever, and it was yeah, it was that that was really the the main interest to kind of see because from a technological point of view, you know, our product's got all this kind of mobile and all this other bits in it, just just to see what that student population was really was was. We're seeing a big increase in you know we, we monitor through our wireless, uh, we, we've got um, Wi-Fi keep uh, enabled. All of campuses and learning centres are Wi-Fi enabled, and so we're seeing an increase in, in students coming with mobile devices and you beginning to use them for accessing courses. They were certainly always coming with them, but now they're beginning to use them for accessing um, Blackboard. We run Blackboard Learn in addition to Blackboard, Blackboard Learn Mobile, um, in addition to the, the desktop system. So that in itself has sort of kicked off students having an expectation that what they're looking at in Blackboard because they get it mobile. Everything needs to be there. We've also seen an increase in, in need and requirement for providing video and audio feedback. So that's starting within the organisation. Um, that's mostly sitting in those areas that 
pretty practical things like music production and uh, performing arts. The students are generating video and the tutor wants to present something back in rich media. In our uh, oral health science and dental therapy courses, they're recording um, medical, uh, you know, surgical clinical procedures and equally the tutor wants to be able to present back to them something, a, a richer form of feedback. Um, th those are, are pretty tightly controlled spaces, I think. Generally, it's type-based feedback at the moment, but in most of the subject areas, there is that increase. Now, the people are, the staff are becoming aware that, that students want audio. I'm, I still have, I'm, I'm interested in, I've been looking at the research in this space, and you know, the students say they want the audio, but if you look to see how many of them have replayed the audio, you know, if they get the grade they expected, they don't, they don't replay the audio. They only repay the audio or they only read their feedback when they get a grade that is either significantly higher or significantly lower than that which they kind of thought they were going to get. Then they want to find out why. Uh, and I think usually when it's lower, they or significantly lower, then they're very keen to find out why. Um, the other thing is that the methods for generating feedback prior to this product coming in place were tedious. You had to use you know, multiple um, multiple little applications um, and then upload material into, uh, in, into uh, the VLE. With the introduction of Camtasia Relay and Lecture Capture, that's certainly streamlined that process. And we're going to see, you know, we see that's increasing day on day with, with activity. I have a next question. Are the off air recordings that you want to make more use of now, yeah? Sorry? The off air, off -air recordings. Yes. So, say you want to, as a lecturer, you want to record something that's on the B. Yes. From start to finish, how does that work? Okay. With um, the, the product we have in place is the, the one that, that Rob mentioned earlier. It's, one la it's a one LAN off air recording facility, uh, it has a web based front end with a television schedule that runs, I think, for the next two weeks probably. So you can scan ahead for two weeks, uh, select any program you want. So all of the staff that want an account on that service, they phone our help desk, they get an account, they can log into the web page and they just hit record and that recording ends up in an off-air recording space category of off-air recording in the Helix Media Library. Um, they can either have it requested to be moved specifically into an area, or we actually prefer them to leave it there and just point at it, and it's an open, it's an open space for all staff and all students. Um, we also, that, that product in the last iteration uh, has a, product, uh, a function called, is it Carousel it's called, Rob, yes? Yeah. yeah. yeah you can go back. We, so we record BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, BBC Four, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that gives us about 10 days back looking, uh, sort of, of pre-recorded material. So that, that material sits in an unpublished uh, recording space on the Helix, sorry, on the, the one LAN uh, recorder. And so if a member of staff comes in and says, there was a really good program on BBC two days ago, could you record it? You go, well, no. But now we connect it. Yes, if it was on in two days ago, yeah, we just go back two days, find it, and then publish it, and across it comes. And we also record, uh, because the island I, I work on and the, the Hebrides and, and the, the north of Scotland is Gaelic speaking, Scottish Gaelic speaking, we also record a number of uh, uh, Gaelic television and Gaelic radio programs uh, in that same carousel. Uh, process to make those available. So it's a very simple, much the same as you would with your Skybox. You can just hit record uh, and the product then arrives. The other thing that we've done is we, where staff have identified programs that they always want. So uh, the, the, I can't think just now of one, but let's say, yeah, they can do a series link or we can do a, 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 an open search. So if the, if the you know, is it clip the, no, what's the click? BBC, is it? Yeah, yeah. That's one that, that our IT guys want recorded. So every time that title arrives in any of the schedules, it's just automatically recorded for them. It's really quite neat. It's quite, quite a nice setup. We have a couple of issues with it to do with the operating system that that product runs on. And it's something I'm going to be discussing <laughs> with them later is I think we're probably going to look to 
change that box out and upgrade it and probably put that box onto our development instance. But I think we're, we are going to have to bite the bullet and get something slightly different. We have NVT, uh, network vulnerability tests, and the software version on that box is causing us a problem at the moment. Just for, just, that's my one piece of bad news about what we've done. It's not actually caused us a problem. All we did was we took the box and put it uh, inside our network, and then we've made it, made it available via uh, a virtual instance uh, on, the, on the web page. So we've, we've secured it in a different way. Yes, sir. Okay. I see you've got 575 categories. What's, the, what's your rationale for having so many? <laughs> we don't really. <laughs> We have, the, the <laughs> if only there was, uh, the categories are spreading out just now to do with personal spaces coming up as categories rather than being embedded within any one space. What I've done with the, the library is it reflects, we have two faculties and I think seven subject networks. So those are the principal um, divisions. Then in addition, we have some pretty secure spaces with clinical materials. So those, in addition to being AD locked down, we're also using uh, one of the other functions within the media library, which would be to lock down by IP. And so the clinical material is only available within clinical teaching spaces, not in public spaces, even in the library. They can only view those materials um, where they're supervised. Um, one of the other elements that we really like about the, the product is that ability to remove, download and embed of course, there's still ways round about that, but uh, it's kind of just a nice way of being able to... Uh, if a student goes through the business of downloading something that we've deemed shouldn't be downloaded, then it's, it's pretty clear that it wasn't a mistake. They've had to go to some efforts to do it, and so we can clobber them. Um, whereas if, if you have the embed code or the, the, the download, then uh, it, it's, it's very easy to make the mistake of just sharing it. Uh, so th those are very important for us. So yeah, as I say, the, the categories are just a, a, an artifact of, of uh, what we're doing in public sp in, in private spaces. Yeah, I, it's a bit of a convoluted question. That, yes. um, <laughs> you uh, mentioned that your VC was keen to get into China and, and mm. America and, and what have you, and that's uh, and part of the, your reasoning for getting uh, Helix was because you want to make these artifacts so you don't have to do it sort of asynchronously. Um, and you, you're making uh, TV off-air programs available through yep. Helix. Uh, do you know what I'm going to ask about? I do. ERA, uh, ERA plus, plus license uh, limits yeah. that to the United Kingdom. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So at the moment, uh, not, not, just, not just those resources, but a range of other resources that we host within the environment, are, are, some are only available within the United Kingdom, some within Europe. Uh, so the licensing, part of the other reason for having different categories is that some of the licensing conditions will dictate that things aren't allowed to, to be viewed outside of uh, UK territories um, or outside of European space. Uh, so uh, absolutely it's a major consideration for us as we start looking at new uh, delivery territories. Um, and fortunately for us we have the ability to limit down by category what would be available externally. And within Blackboard, again, we'll have separate Blackboard. We have the ability to create separate Blackboard, Blackboard modules for UK distribution or for international, uh, which would have slightly different content. I actually think the content is going to have to be changed in a large number of these modules just to do with uh, the needs and require requirements of non-native speakers uh, or cultural differences in terms of the, the audience if I, where, where material has been uh, has a, an overly UK-centric kind of uh, focus, and you want to deliver that externally, then you might need, you, I think it's pretty obvious we're going to need to change the content. The ability with uh, the product to support closed captions, I think, is one of the important things as well. Um, not just for accessibility, we've got that whole issue of meeting accessibility requirements, so video objects that um, are standalone should have either a transcript or closed captions or both, certainly supported within the product. One of the things I'm going to be working on next year, uh, next academic year, sorry, no, next calendar year, is looking at ways of auto-generating in a decent way um, 
transcript <laughs> from the audio files. I'm looking at uh, Speech Dragon and various other bits of software and building profiles for some of our staff to see whether we can automate using MP3 downloads, uh, file creation and automatic transcripts. Um, I have looked also, I was discussing uh, with Dave, I think it might have been, uh, or Chris, the costs of having material transcribed by humans. It's kind of expensive, but it might be something we have to start considering as a, a product, part of the production value cost of using video to international audiences. And certainly there are a number of companies out there that will do this for you. You simply send them the MP3 file and back comes the transcript, or you send them the video and back it comes with closed captions. We've looked at doing that in the product. It's just uh, uh, the business case mm. for doing it, really. So there's there's a couple of different companies that will produce captions, uh, semi uh, semi produced by humans, by stenographers. Right. <coughs> but I, I mean, it is quite an expensive way of doing it, though. It really is. I mean, you're talking about for an hour of video maybe about $150 for, for an hour. Yeah, so, but they're very good. I yes. mean, the accuracy is, is brilliant, and it is good. But what I found is that as I've peeled away the layers of the onion with all this uh, closed caption stuff, we, we can support it in the player. And actually, the, the latest version of our software, which we'll show later, will support it on different devices as well. But even in America, where there's potential litigation yes. for not doing it, people doing it on a needs basis. So they'll, they'll say, well, there's this particular course that's being run, and we have two people that are hard of hearing on it, mm. so we'll do it. Or there's this particular course that has these people with whatever disability, and we will do it. But if they had a course that had no one on it that had those needs, they, yes. they wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Just any, and I think what it is, is a lot of these companies were set up thinking, wow, there's this ADA compliance thing, yes. we're going to make a ton of money doing this. And actually, it's not happened because mm. the organizations, if you're producing, I mean, we're talking about this video conferencing content, thousands of hours worth yes. of content. I mean, your bill <laughs> would literally be, you know, the budget yes. of a small country or something. It, 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 it would, would be it would enormous. Be crazy, yes. uh, no, at the end of it, it yeah. really would be a big yes. bill, wouldn't it? So I think that's why it's not happened. And the business case for doing it, you talk to people about it and say, would that be a good thing to do? And they immediately say yes. But then when you talk about, well, we could do this, and there's this API that these companies have got, when you talk about the cost of it, they kind of say, well, actually, maybe not. We'll do it on a needs basis. And actually, the, the, the way of doing it on a needs basis is setting up an account with one of these companies. You could even provide them with just the link to yes. the media library page. You don't even have to upload the file. Yeah. I mean, the companies that I've used, you can just provide the link. And then they will do the stenography on it, and then they'll make it available within a portal, and you just upload that through the media yeah. library. So it's sort of, I think it's something that would be really nice to do in the product, but it's just, it's one of those sort of things that people r think they really want, but when it, it comes to the crunch, <coughs> it would be done on a fairly l small scale. I think. So perhaps in the admin space of the product, mm. it would be kind of useful if you, if you have a number of companies or a preferred company that you know works well with the product, you know, yeah. in terms of what they're going to feed back. If that was listed, even if you know, like, so you know, if you yeah, need this yeah. done, if click here, captions, and then it shoves you across to their website. Yeah. It's something uh, we all kind of dance around. Everyone goes, "Oh yes, accessibility is important," um, and it is. And it's expensive uh, if you want to do it well. And in most of these cases, what we would end up probably doing is pre presenting an alternative learning object or alternative learning experience for accessibility in terms of disability. I think there's also that business of accessibility in terms of just basic learning for things like students with non-native English speakers, where being able to read as well as listen is, is an important part of their course. Um, uh, the other thing I think that comes from being able to do this and having the transcript is you can use it as a means of um, a, tagging and searching within the media type. So you, there's a number of benefits if it's done. Um, but being able to do it well at the moment is pretty problematic. Certainly, I've used Camtasia Studio. And with my accent, it doesn't work at all well, uh, I can tell you. Uh, it doesn't like me at all. 
where I've managed to build a profile for myself in some other products, then I'm getting pretty much an acceptable result. And what I've been trying to do with some of the academic staff is have them sit down and read through the Alice in Wonderland book, as it were, in terms of building their profile. When they do that, it works very, very well. Especially if they're sitting doing something like a screen, ca screen capture sec session, where, it, where it's more formal. They're sitting at a PC, talking to a set of slides to generate a learning object. It works perfectly. It's less obvious in the situation here, where we're talking more freely, uh, then it, it's less, less useful. Just to pick up on that question about um, sort of turning speech to text for keywording for discovery, I know I, I don't know if there's anyone here from Oxford, but they did a project where they were chaining together open source components so that they did that entirely for free. Um, and they did get to a good level of accuracy enough that you could then tag the content. But obviously, it, it needs a bit of development in house because it's chaining things together. Right, cool, interesting, thank you. That's good to know. It just wasn't there at no. all because that's what we looked at initially in the captions project was to do it entirely through speech recognition and the accuracy was about 25 percent we just thought mm. it's just junk it's just not yes. worth doing so but it's interesting if that is a name of the project yeah it's cool it's called spindle, spindle. Okay. all right cool yeah. thank you that's yeah, yeah that's really the two, useful the two that we considered, I mean, we, we never kind of plumped for one or the other, it's still sort of parked really, was a company called Automatic Sync, and there was a company called CLO24 as well, C-I-E-L-O 24, right. CLO I think in Spanish means heaven, heaven, heaven 24, right. I don't know why that name is whatever, but they, the latter of the two were, were very good at doing it for lots of different languages. And actually, oh. the, the videos that are on all of the different language versions of our websites were done through them. The former of the two companies, Automatic Sync, the accuracy was much better, but they would only do US and Spanish. That, that was it. That was their remit, because obviously, okay. they're yeah. a US-based oh, company, yeah. and they'd do that <coughs> too. But the other one seems to do everything, Chinese, yeah. Japanese, everything, oh. which was good. But they are both expensive. I'm not going to make out they're cheap. Right. <laughs> I mean, we, we had a, a research project last year, which, which was kind of cool, which does the reverse of this. It's a podcasting. We, we built a podcasting service for the university to allow staff to upload audio. And then I cunningly decided that what I'd also like to put into the podcasting was the ability to drop a Word document or a text document in there and generate audio. So we've built that in conjunction with Edinburgh University Seraproc. So it uses a very, very nice artificial voice, uh, Scottish artificial voice, uh, to generate audio. So for, again, for accessibility purposes, anything that we generate now in, in text, we can actually programmatically and automatically have it output as, uh, as an audio file in MP3, encapsulated as a podcast. So it's automatically fed to students. Oh, yeah. You mentioned Mahara integration. Can yeah. you just tell me what, what you did with that? All we did with that, the Mahara embed, in, in Mahara there's a couple of options for embedding video and neither of them would take the embed code from, you know, one was specifically for YouTube and I think another one for one of the other, uh, Daily Motion or whatever, Vimeo. Uh, we just tweaked a little bit of that. Uh, tweaked a little bit of the, the YouTube one, I think, such that it happily now accepts Helix Media Library. So it was simply, I mean, we had a lot of students, we're having now a lot of students uh, making small recordings of things like their, their uh, uh, playing musical instruments, that type of thing for, for performing arts or music. And so when they're generating their portfolio, they wanted to include those as evidence of what they're, what they're doing. And uh, so to streamline that and make sure that the, the embed was sweet and worked and would actually fit in a, in a reasonable portfolio page, we just had, did a tiny bit of work there. So it is something I think that there's probably quite a number of people using Mahara that aren't using, they're not Mahoodle typed schools, but they might have Blackboard, but Mahara for ePortfolio. Uh, so it is worth maybe thinking about that embed and making sure that, I, I, it was a tiny tweak we did, but. Plugin for Mahara? At the moment, it's, it's something that's been mentioned to me quite a few times, and I think we were a bit taken aback by the adoption of that as a product. We didn't really have it as much mm. on our radar as, as what we could have done. I'm surprised that the iframe doesn't work in it. 
I don't think it was anything major. It was it, it did need tweaking, and I think that the guy that did it butchered the uh, YouTube one. So I think it's, <laughs> but it is a separate little box now, and it says Helix. Um, yeah, so it's not just that it's the, the YouTube one. It's it actually, it's another way of in, encouraging, it was for us also another way of encouraging the students to remember that they had a Helix space. It is, it is, um, I think it's LTI, it was LTI, wasn't it, Mahara? Uh, I think it's LTI compliant. So I mean, in theory, as a basic LTI tool, mm. ours would probably work anyway without yeah. doing any development. So yeah, that would be interesting if somebody's up for me getting access to their Mahara, we could give it a go. Yep. We could give it a go. We have a development instance happening yeah. to share with you, yeah. That'd be because cool. this is one thing just to fill you in about the LTI bit that we did. So Chris showed you a, a Blackboard and a Moodle integration. They are effectively plugins and building blocks that have been written specifically for Blackboard and Moodle mm. to make them work as they do, you know, we <coughs> hope fairly elegantly. But in developing those, we use this LTI technology, which is this learning tools interoperability, which is just a standard for, for developing integrations for VLEs. And one of the side effects that we had was when we were developing it, so somebody came to us from the States and said, oh, have you got an integration with Canvas? Mm. We're kind of like, well, no, but let's have a look at this. We had a look at it, and we just put in the LTI URL that we currently use for Blackboard and Moodle, the key and the secret, and pretty much it worked yeah. out of the box. There wasn't a lot. We, we, we tweaked it a little bit to make it work. So unofficially, we have something for mm. Canvas as well, which is, I know, one that a few people are looking at, because I actually get a bit more... <laughs> Uh, from the UK even on Canvas now. And actually anything that's LTI, as long as you can launch that LTI URL and do your bit within it, it's yep. almost what comes back, which is the important bit. So within Canvas, for example, you would upload your video and then there's just a link that's put in the text editor saying video. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Blackboard and Moodle, we're doing a nice kind of embed of the, the media player. So it's not as elegant, but in something like Mahara, the experience you should get is just that you click on something. I mean, it might be a button in an editor. I don't know what you can configure in Mahara, but you can certainly do that in Canvas. You'd click on it, you'd do your bit, whatever you want to do within it, and then at the end of it, it would probably just put a link on the page. Right. So I would, I would be surprised if something like Mahara mm. didn't just work out of the box, but it won't be as elegant mm. as what the Moodle and Blackboard things are. If you want to try it, just go into Mahara, and there'll be... I mean, I don't know Mahara that well, but... There'll be a way of configuring an LTI tool within it. If you, if you cut and paste the LTI URL that you have in Blackboard and Moodle, which is just the upload website of the media library, um, appended with slash LTI, and then you put your key and your secret in, that, that will tell you how to the extent to which it works. Mm. And then let us know, because if we need to tweak it a bit, there's a massive business case for us doing it. Mm -hmm. And we did it for Canvas as a kind of sort of project to, to make right. sure that we could support it. I, I was working with Vers Versal. I don't know, if, has anybody looked at that as a learning environment space? <coughs> Versal.com. Really nice. If you haven't looked at it, have a look at that. Um, drag and drop typed uh, uh, <coughs> authoring space. Um, and I tried the video and it wouldn't work. So I got in touch with them and they said, no problem, we'll tweak our, our box and it now works. Um, so, uh, if you haven't looked, versal.com, well worth a wee look at, especially if somebody wants to do fast, nice looking uh, online development outside of what you normally do institutionally. If they find Blackboard abhorrent and awful and Moodle not any good either, uh, then Versal is quite interesting, I think, as, a, as a, an alternative. We're certainly looking at Canvas as an organisation as well at the moment. We're constantly having to keep an eye on what is out there and for us, any move away from Black, we've been with Blackboard since 1999. Um, so we're kind of like embedded in there, entrenched in the Blackboard space. We've had two or three goes of coming away from Blackboard to other things and we always end up going back. The staff all rebel and the student, well, the students less so, but the staff all rebel. Um, but certainly I think as numbers increase in the Blackboard model, keeps sitting round about capitation, uh, then the costs, Escalate and our you know return on investment and value for money start to be questioned, certainly by our new vice chancellor. Uh, so I think that uh, for us we constantly have to look at what's what's out there, 
And bear in mind that if we wanted to move anything substantially out of our VLE, then it's going to be like a two-year project plan for us to do anything. You know, so we're always looking like a, our, our planning horizon is two to three years in changes of technology. It will break if anybody's got any more cool. questions for John. I'm sure whilst he's you munching can find me. Yeah, cool. sandwich, he'll, he'll answer them. We're going to break for lunch now. Cool. Thanks. Here. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's about 10 past now. If we present in an hour.